All right, so here we go. Today, we got a new person for you guys, Dr. Alexa Tenwaldi. She's gonna be here today to talk about a little good news, how a little different case. So I'm gonna bring her on, she's gonna share it. Welcome. Hello, hello. <laughs> I'm gonna turn it loose to you. We're gonna share your screen and then just walk us through uh, these findings here, walk us through what they mean, why they're hopeful for, for the crowd. So I'm gonna pull, I'm gonna let you have it, off we go. Okay, awesome. Yes, I just really wanted to share um, some of these data points because they were so exciting and we were celebrating so much in the clinic the last couple of days over this. In the clinic, we do often get patients that come in that have maybe had a traditional tilt done in another clinic. And um, some clinics do, they, they do a great job of measuring certain data points. Maybe you'll get um, get those data points. Uh, but I think one of the bigger things that we maybe don't see in a lot of other clinics is measuring with that transcranial Doppler. So getting that mean velocity blood flow is something that I think really sets us apart um, for when we're getting the full picture of all of this. Uh, I'll take it a little step deeper. So they typically yeah. don't cover these, although that is why that's kind of like the purpose of why we're here is mm -hmm. to maybe try to see if we can cajole, is cajole a good word? Uh, people into starting to adapt some of these techniques. So that's kind of our hope and our prayer. Um, but I wanted to show for this patient, um, we have her, her initial tilt exam. And a lot of you have probably seen these charts on previous streams. So you have kind of an idea of what these numbers mean, but I'll still kind of walk through that a little bit just to make sure we're all on the same page. But um, this is a patient that came in with some like severe fatigue, dizziness, uh, like presyncope type symptoms upon standing. So. This is our bread and butter that we see quite a bit in the clinic. And uh, yeah, so here's our initial exam with her. Uh, this is our first couple minutes of supine and our heart rate here. So we can see we're at like a pretty decent heart rate coming through here where we went over that ETCO2 last week on the stream. Super happy we got into that. And, uh, and then in these darker gray boxes, this is when we actually get into orthostasis. orthostasis. This is where we have that 70 degree tilt. And we can see on this initial exam, these are these two, the two columns we're really looking at here, the mean percentage change that we see when we go upright against gravity into orthostasis. We want these numbers to remain ideally above 85%. So that's an 85% of the mean velocity that we can maintain uh, compared to baseline. So we can see these bolded numbers here. Um, she did not quite maintain that on her first tilt. So as we're measuring minute by minute here, we can see there's quite a bit of fatigability to it. She's dropping down into the 70s down to a 69 down here. This this row here is where she did some dual tasking. We had we gave her a math equation to do. She did really well with that. And you can see that right after we got done, fatigability crashed back down again. Um, and then after that initial exam, we got to work. And this is a patient that's been, she's just so eager to get to work every day. We were loving the energy. We're getting a lot accomplished and after seven days of treatment we said okay let's let's take another look at this tilt exam so right away you can see from this heart rate minute by minute like compared to our initial where we jump up into the 120s beats per minute now on our re-exam we're hanging down here in the 80s this was super great to see but Previously, the reason that we were getting a big increase in this heart rate was because we were trying to make up for not having enough of that cerebral blood flow. Now I'm going to move the chart over to this side here and we can see, wow, these numbers blew us away. 
So immediately right off the get-go, right out of the gate, minute one, she is maintaining that blood flow and she does not give it up the rest of the test. We were so happy with these results. She's maintaining that velocity of the blood throughout the entire test. Um, there was not that fatigability at the end of it either. She maintained it strong. And then also with that, we didn't have to have such a big compensatory heart rate increase. And so this is a good sign into showing that, that we're maintaining our blood flow. I also really wanted to point out too, those ETCO2 levels, just because we, I know we talked about it last week on the stream. So her initial exam here, we can see we're dropping these numbers down into the low 20s, far too low. After seven days of treatment, I think we still have improvements to be made, but now we're hanging out high 20s, low 30s. This was also just super great to see. We were all celebrating. Um, I just, once we got out of this tilt exam, I just knew we we really wanted to show this on the live stream, show the world. We're all celebrating. And yeah, I think these are some really fun numbers to to share with you all. So yeah. What do you think, Dr. Kaiser? Awesome. You got the first one in. And I also think mm -hmm. that I went to go respond to uh, to one of the chats and then it kicked me out of chat, which is super fun. So I'm, I'm officially logged out of the chat <laughs> trying to get um, YouTube to verify that I am here. So I'm supposed to be opening my phone and clicking number, whatever this That's number right. is, and it's not working. Anyway, so yeah, so I... The thing that really excites me is is so many people, um, it's just, a, it's curious, right? They're wondering like, what is going on over there? And it's just a, a, an insight into, into that progression. So we talk so much about cerebral flow, right? But mm -hmm. then like, how does that translate to this thing everybody's worried about with heart rate? And then you can see just really clearly where the overlap is, right? So if you can actually make the system more efficient at distributing blood, then the heart doesn't have to work so hard. And then you can see that in the outcomes. And that's what Dr. Tenwaldi showed here. Great job first go around. I love it. Ooh, thank um, you. <laughs> yeah. So it's really cool. And you know, the, the important part is we talked about this a couple weeks ago, but I think it's worth sharing again. It's just this idea of like, this is kind of like the baseline substrate for just being healthy. So if we can if we can think about, you know, we talk a lot about not just POTS and dysautonomia, but also, you know, MECFS and, and problems where it's just really hard to get any energy running, right? And so oxygen, glucose, is, they're like the substrate. That's like what you, that's, it's like what the ingredients are for making energy. So if we're having a hard time being able to continually give the brain the ingredients, um, it, then it makes it, it makes it really hard to run it. You can't run the car on empty, same with your brain. And so we focus on that. And then we you wanna use that in order to let the body heal. And I think that part's important is at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to do is, is put in the right conditions so that the body can heal on its own. Like we don't, we're not in the business of healing people bodies heal, they heal themselves, right? They, that's where the process happens. Uh, it's not from the exogenous part. So we're just trying to create an environment where they do, and that's what's that's the magic of it. So it's worth talking about. 